This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 2 of Anarchy Works Decisions Anarchy is the absence of rulers. Free people do not follow orders. They make their own decisions and come to agreements within their communities and develop shared means for putting these decisions into practice. Part 1. How will decisions be made? There should be no doubt that human beings can make decisions in non-hierarchical, egalitarian ways. The majority of human societies have been stateless, and many stateless societies have not been governed by the dictates of some quote-unquote big man, but by common assemblies using some form of consensus. Numerous consensus-based societies have survived thousands of years, even through European colonialism into the present day, in Africa, Australia, Asia, the Americas, and on the peripheries of Europe. People from societies in which decision-making power has been monopolized by the state and corporations may initially find it difficult to make decisions in an egalitarian way, but it gets easier with practice. Fortunately, we all have some experience with horizontal decision-making. Most of the decisions we make in daily life, with friends, and hopefully with colleagues and family as well, we make on the basis of cooperation rather than authority. Friendship is precious because it is a state in which we interact as equals, where our opinions are valued regardless of our social status. Groups of friends typically use informal consensus to decide how to spend time together, organize activities, assist one another, and respond to challenges in their daily lives. So most of us already understand consensus intuitively. It takes more practice to learn how to come to consensus with people who are significantly different from us, especially in large groups, or when it is necessary to coordinate complex activities. But it is possible. Consensus is not the only empowering way to make decisions. In certain contingencies, Groups that are truly voluntary associations can still be empowering for their members when they use majority decision-making. Or one person making her own decisions and acting alone can inspire dozens more people to take similar actions or to support what she has started, thus avoiding the sometimes stifling weight of meetings. In creative or inspiring circumstances, people often succeed in coordinating themselves spontaneously and chaotically, producing unprecedented results. The specific decision-making form is just a tool, and with consensus or individual action, as with majority decision-making, people can take an active part in using that tool as they see fit. Korean anarchists won an opportunity to demonstrate people's ability to make their own decisions in 1929. The Korean Anarchist Communist Federation was a huge organization at that time with enough support that it could declare an autonomous zone in the Shinmin province. Shinmin was just outside of Korea, in Manchuria, but two million Korean immigrants lived there. Using assemblies and a decentralized federative structure that grew out of the KACF, they created village councils, district councils, and area councils to deal with matters of cooperative agriculture, education, and finance. They also formed an army spearheaded by the anarchist Kim Jua Jin, who used guerrilla tactics against Soviet and Japanese forces. KACF sections in China, Korea, and Japan organized international support efforts. Caught between the Stalinists and the Japanese Imperial Army, the autonomous province was ultimately crushed in 1931. But for two years, large populations had freed themselves from the authority of landlords and governors and reasserted their power to come to collective decisions, to organize their day-to-day -day life, pursue their dreams, and defend those dreams from invading armies. One of the most well-known anarchist histories is that of the Spanish Civil War. In July 1936, General Franco launched a fascist coup in Spain. From the standpoint of the elite, it was a necessary act. The nation's military officers, landowners, and religious hierarchy were terrified by growing anarchist and socialist movements. The monarchy had already been established, but the workers and peasants were not content with representative democracy. 
The coup did not go smoothly. While in many areas Spain's republican government rolled over easily and resigned itself to fascism, the anarchist labor union, CNT, and other anarchists, working autonomously, formed militias, seized arsenals, stormed barracks, and defeated trained troops. Anarchists were especially strong in Catalonia, Aragon, Asturias, and much of Andalusia. Workers also defeated the coup in Madrid and Valencia, where the socialists were strong, and in much of the Basque country. In the anarchist areas, the government effectively ceased to function. In these stateless areas of the Spanish countryside in 1936, peasants organized themselves according to principles of communism, collectivism, or mutualism according to their preferences and local conditions. They formed thousands of collectives, especially in Aragon, Catalonia, and Valencia. Some abolished all money and private property. Some organized quota systems to ensure that everyone's needs were met. The diversity of forms they developed is a testament to the freedom they created themselves. Where once all these villages were mired in the same stifling context of feudalism and developing capitalism, within months of overthrowing government authority and coming together in village assemblies, they gave birth to hundreds of different systems, united by common values like solidarity and self-organization. And they developed these different forms by holding open assemblies and making decisions about their future in common. The town of Magdalena de Pulpus, for example, abolished money completely. One inhabitant reported, Everyone works, and everyone has the right to what he needs free of charge. He simply goes to the store where provisions and all other necessities are supplied. Everything is distributed free, with only a notation of what he took. Recording what everyone took allowed the community to distribute resources equally in times of scarcity, and generally ensured accountability. Other collectives worked out their own systems of exchange. They issued local money in the form of vouchers, tokens, rationing booklets, certificates, and coupons, which carried no interest and were not negotiable outside of the issuing collective. Communities that had suppressed money paid workers in coupons according to the size of the family, a family wage based on the needs of the family rather than the productivity of its working members. Abundant local goods like bread, wine, and olive oil were distributed freely, while other items, quote, could be obtained by means of coupons at the communal depot. Surplus goods were exchanged with other anarchist towns and villages. End quote. There was much experimentation with new monetary systems. In Aragon, there were hundreds of different kinds of coupon and money systems, so the Aragon Federation of Peasant Collectives unanimously decided to replace local currencies with a standard ration booklet though each collective retained the power to decide how goods would be distributed and the amount of coupons workers would receive. All the collectives, once they had taken control of their villages, organized open mass assemblies to discuss problems and plan how to organize themselves. Decisions were made via voting or consensus. Village assemblies generally met between once a week and once a month. Foreign observers surveying them remarked that participation was broad and enthusiastic. Many of the collectivized villages joined with other collectives in order to pool resources, aid one another, and arrange trade. The collectives in Aragon donated hundreds of tons of food to the volunteer militias who were holding back the fascists on the front, and also took in large numbers of refugees who had fled the fascists. The town of Graus, for example, with a population of 2,600, took in and supported 224 refugees, only 20 of whom could work. At assemblies, collectives discussed problems and proposals. Many collectives elected administrative committees, generally consisting of half a dozen people, to manage affairs until the next meeting. The open assemblies, quote, allowed the inhabitants to know, to so understand, and to feel so mentally integrated in society, to so participate in the management of public affairs, in the responsibilities, that the recriminations, the tensions, which always occur when the power of decision is entrusted to a few individuals, did not happen here. The assemblies were public, the objections, the proposals publicly discussed, everybody being free, as in the syndical assemblies, to participate in the discussions, to criticize, propose, etc., democracy extended to the whole of social life. In most cases, even the individualists, 
locals who had not joined the collective, could take part in the deliberations. They were given the same hearing as the collectivists. End quote. If not every village inhabitant was a member of the collective, there might be a municipal council in addition to the collective assembly, so that no one would be excluded from decision making. In many collectives, they agreed that if a member violated a collective rule once, he was reprimanded. If it happened a second time, he was referred to the general assembly. Only the general assembly could expel a member from the collective. Delegates and administrators were denied punitive power. The power of the general assembly to respond to transgressions was also used to prevent people who had been delegated tasks from being irresponsible or authoritarian. Delegates or elected administrators who failed to abide by collective decisions or usurped authority were suspended or removed by a general vote. In some villages that were split between anarchists and socialists, the peasants formed two collectives side by side to allow for different ways of making and enforcing decisions rather than imposing one method on everybody. Gaston Laval described a general assembly in the village of Tamarit de Letira in Huesca province, which the non-collective peasants were also allowed to attend. One problem brought up at the meeting was that several peasants who had not joined the collective left their elderly parents in the care of the collective while taking their parents' land to farm as their own. The entire group discussed the matter and eventually decided to adopt a specific proposal. They would not kick the elderly parents out of the collective, but they wanted to hold those peasants accountable, so they decided that the latter had to take care of their parents or else receive neither solidarity nor land from the collective. In the end, a resolution agreed to by an entire community will carry more legitimacy and is more likely to be followed than one handed down by a specialist or a government official. Important decisions also took place at work in the fields every day. Quote, the work of the collectives was conducted by a team of workers headed by a delegate chosen by each team. The land was divided into cultivated zones. Team delegates worked like the others. There were no special privileges. After the day's work, delegates from all the work teams met on the job and made necessary technical arrangements for the next day's work. The assembly made final decisions on all important questions and it issued instructions to both the team delegates and the administrative commission." End quote. Many areas also had district committees that pooled the resources of all the collectives in a district, basically acting as a clearinghouse to circulate surplus from the collectives that had it to other collectives that needed it. Hundreds of collectives joined federations organized through the CNT or UGT, the Socialist Labor Union. The federations provided economic coordination, pooling resources to allow peasants to build their own fruit and vegetable canneries, gathering information about which items were in abundance and which were in short supply, and organizing uniform exchange systems. This collective form of decision-making proved effective for approximately 7 to 8 million peasants evolved in this movement. Half the land of anti-fascist Spain, three-quarters of the land in Aragon, was collectivized and self-organized. In August 1937, just over a year after anarchist and socialist peasants started forming collectives, the Republican government, under control of the Stalinists, had consolidated enough to move against the lawless zones of Aragon. The Karl Marx Brigade, units of the International Brigades, and other units disarmed and dissolved the collectives in Aragon crushing any resistance and spiriting off numerous anarchists and libertarian socialists to the prisons and torture chambers the Stalinists had set up to use against their revolutionary allies. Brazil today bears a similarity with Spain in 1936 in that a tiny percentage of the population owns nearly half of all the land, while millions of people are without land or sustenance. A major social movement has sprung up in response. The Movimiento dos Trabalhadores Ruais Sem Terra, MST, or Landless Workers Movement, is made up of 1.5 million impoverished laborers who occupy unused land to set up farming collectives. Since its founding in 1984, the MST has won land titles for 350,000 families living in 2,000 different settlements. The basic unit of organization consists of a group of families living together in a settlement on occupied land. These groups retain autonomy and self-organize matters of day-to-day -day living. They participate in the regional meetings, 
They appoint two or three representatives, which in principle include a man and a woman, though in practice this is not always the case. The MST has a federative structure. There are also na state and national coordinating bodies. While most of the decision-making takes place at the grassroots level, with land occupations, farming, and the establishment of settlements, the MST also organizes at higher levels to coordinate massive protests and highway blockades to pressure the government to give land titles to the settlements. The MST has shown a great deal of innovation and strength, organizing schools and protecting themselves against frequent police repression. They have developed practices of sustainable agriculture, which includes setting up seed banks for native seeds, and they have invaded and destroyed environmentally harmful eucalyptus forestry plantations and test grounds for genetically modified crops. Within the logic of democracy, 1.5 million people is considered simply too large a group for everyone to be allowed to participate directly in decision making. The majority should entrust that power to politicians. But the MST holds an ideal in which all possible decision making remains on the local level. In practice, however, they often do not meet this ideal. As a massive organization that does not seek to abolish capitalism or overthrow the state, but rather to pressure it, the MST has been brought into the game of politics, in which all principles are for sale. Furthermore, a huge portion of their members come from extremely poor and oppressed communities that for generations had been controlled by a combination of religion, patriotism, crime, drug addiction, and patriarchy. These dynamics do not disappear when people enter into the movement and they cause significant problems within the MST. Throughout the 80s and 90s, new MST settlements were created by activists from the organization who would seek landless people in rural areas, or especially in the favelas, the urban slums, who wanted to form a group and occupy land. They would go through a base building period of two months in which they would hold meetings and debates to try to build a sense of community, affinity, and political common ground. Then they would occupy a piece of unused land owned by a major landlord, choose representatives to federate with the larger organization, and begin farming. Activists working with the MST local would pass through periodically to see if the settlement needed help acquiring tools and materials, resolving internal disputes, or protecting themselves from police, paramilitaries, or major landlords, all of whom frequently conspired to threaten and assassinate MST members. In part due to the autonomy of each settlement, they have met with a variety of outcomes. Leftists from other countries typically romanticize the MST, while the Brazilian capitalist media portray them as all violent thugs who steal land and then sell it. In fact, the capitalist media portrayal is accurate in some cases, though by no means in a majority of cases. It is not unheard of for people in a new settlement to divide up the land and later fight over the allotments. Some might sell their allotment to a local landlord, or open a liquor store on their allotment and fuel alcoholism, or encroach on their neighbor's allotment, and such boundary disputes are sometimes resolved with violence. The majority of settlements divide into completely individualized separate homesteads, rather than working the land collectively or communally. Another common weakness reflects the society from which these landless workers come. Many of the settlements are dominated by a Christian, patriotic, and patriarchal culture. Though its weaknesses need to be addressed, the MST has achieved a long list of victories. The movement has won land and self-sufficiency for a huge number of extremely poor people. Many of the settlements they create enjoy a much higher standard of living than the slums they left behind and are bound by a sense of solidarity and community. By any measure, their accomplishment is a triumph for direct action. By disregarding legality or petitioning the powerful for change, over a million people have won themselves land and control over their lives by going out and doing it themselves. Brazilian society has not collapsed due to this wave of anarchy. On the contrary, it has become healthier, although many problems remain, in the society at large and in the settlement. It largely comes down to circumstance whether a particular settlement is empowering and liberated or competitive and oppressive. According to an MST worker who worked for several years in one of the most dangerous regions of Brazil, two months was simply not enough time in most cases to overcome people's antisocial training and create a real sense of community. But it was much better than the prevalent pattern in the subsequent period. 
As the organization experienced a rush to grow, many activists began slapping together settlements by recruiting groups of strangers, promising them land, and sending them off into the regions with the poorest soil or the most violent landlords, often contributing to deforestation in the process. Naturally, this emphasis on quantitative results amplified the worst characteristics of the organization and in many ways weakened it, even as its political power increased. The context for this watershed in the MST was the election of President Lula of the Workers' Party, PT, in 2003. Previously, the MSD had been autonomous. They did not cooperate with political parties or allow politicians into the organization, although many organizers used the MST to launch political careers. But with the unprecedented victory of the Progressive Socialist Workers' Party, the leadership of the MST tried to forbid anyone in the organization from publicly speaking out against the government's new agrarian policy. At the same time, the MST began receiving huge amounts of money from the government. Lula had promised to give land to a certain number of families, and the MST leadership rushed to fill this quota and engorge their own organization, abandoning their base and their principles. Many influential MST organizers and leaders, backed by the more radical settlements, criticized this collaboration with the government and pushed for a more anti-authoritarian stance. And in fact, by 2005, when the PT's agrarian program proved to be a disappointment, the MST began fiercely challenging the government again. In the eyes of anti-authoritarians, the organization had lost its credibility and proven once again the predictable results of collaboration with the government. But within the movement, there are still many causes for inspiration. Many of the settlements continue to demonstrate the ability of people to overcome their capitalist and authoritarian socialization if they take it upon themselves to do so. Perhaps the best example are the Comunas de Terra, a network of settlements that make up a minority within the MST that farm the land communally, nurture a spirit of solidarity, challenge sexism and capitalist mindsets internally, and create working examples of anarchy. It is notable that the people in the Comunas de Terra enjoy a higher standard of life than those who live in the individualized settlements. There are contemporary examples of non-hierarchical organization in North America as well. Throughout the United States today, there exist dozens of anarchist projects that are run on a consensus basis. Consensus decision-making may be used on an ad hoc basis to plan an event or campaign, or more permanently to run an info shop an anarchist social center that can serve as a radical bookshop, library, cafe, meeting space, concert hall, or free store. A typical meeting night might begin with volunteers filling the positions of facilitator and note taker. Many groups also use a vibes watcher, someone who volunteers to, sp to pay special attention to emotions and interactions within the group, recognizing that the person is political and that the tradition of suppressing emotions in public spaces derives from the separation of public and private, a separation on which patriarchy and the state are based. Next, the participants create an agenda in which they list all the topics they want to talk about. For each topic, they start by sharing information. If a decision needs to be made, they talk it over until they find a point where everyone's needs and desires converge. Someone states a proposal that synthesizes everyone's input, and they vote on it, approve, abstain, or block. If one person is opposed, the group looks for another solution. The decisions may not always be everyone's first choice, but everyone must feel comfortable with every decision the group makes. Throughout this process, the facilitator encourages full participation from everyone and makes sure no one is silenced. Sometimes, the group is unable to solve a particular problem, but the option of not coming to any decision demonstrates that within consensus, the health of the group is more important than efficiency. Such groups form on the principle of voluntary association, Anyone is free to leave if she wishes, in contrast to authoritarian structures that may deny people the right to leave or exempt themselves from an arrangement they do not agree to. According to this principle, it is better to respect the differing views of the members of the group than to enforce a decision that leaves some people excluded or silenced. This may seem impractical to those who have not participated in such a process, but consensus has served many info shops and similar projects in the U.S. for years. Using consensus, these groups have made the decisions necessary to organize spaces and events, reach out to the surrounding communities, bring in new participants, raise money, and resist attempts by local government and business leaders to shut them down. 
What's more, it seems like the number of projects using consensus in the US is only growing. Granted, consensus works best for people who know one another and have a common interest in working together, whether they are volunteers who want to run an info shop, neighbors who want to resist gentrification, or members of an affinity group planning attacks against the system. But it does work. A common complaint is that consensus meetings take longer, but are they really less efficient? Authoritarian models of decision-making, including majority voting, in which the minority is forced to conform to the decision of the majority, hide or externalize their true costs. Communities that use authoritarian means to make their decisions cannot exist without police or some other structure to enforce these decisions. Consensus precludes the need for enforcement and punishment by making sure that everyone is satisfied beforehand. When we take into account all the work hours a community loses maintaining a police force, which is a huge drain on resources, the hours spent in consensus meetings seem like a good usage of time after all. The rebellion in the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca offer us another example of popular decision making. In 2006, people took over Oaxaca City and much of the state. The population of Oaxaca is over half indigenous, and their struggles there against colonialism and capitalism go back 500 years. In June 2006, 70,000 striking teachers gathered in Oaxaca de Juarez, the capital, to press their demands for a living wage and better facilities for the students. On June 14th, the police attacked the teachers' encampment, but the teachers fought back, forcing the police out of the center of the city, taking over government buildings and evicting politicians, and setting up barricades to keep them out. Oaxaca City was self-organized and autonomous for five months, until federal troops were sent in. After they forced the police out of the capital city, the striking teachers were joined by students and other workers, and together they formed the Asamblea Popular de los Pueblos de Oaxaca, Popular Assembly of the Peoples of Oaxaca. The APPO became a coordinating body for the social movements of Oaxaca, effectively organizing social life and popular resistance for several months in the vacuum tr created by the collapse of state control. It brought together delegates from unions, non-governmental organizations, social organizations, and cooperatives across the state, seeking to make decisions in the spirit of indigenous practices of consensus, although most assemblies made decisions with a majority vote. APPO founders rejected electoral politics and called for people throughout the state to organize their own assemblies at every level. Recognizing the role of political parties in co-opting popular movements, the APPO banned them from participating. According to one activist who helped to found the APPO, so the APPO was formed to address the abuses and could create an alternative. It was to be a space for discussion, reflection, analysis, and action. We recognize that it shouldn't be just one organization, but rather a blanket coordinating body for many different groups. That is, not one ideology would prevail. We would focus on finding the common ground among diverse social actors. Students, teachers, anarchists, Marxists, churchgoers, everyone was invited. The APPO was born without a formal structure, but soon developed impressive organizational capacity. Decisions in the APPO are made by consensus within the General Assembly, which was privileged as a decision-making body. In the first few weeks of our existence, we created the APPO State Council. The council was originally composed of 260 people, approximately 10 representatives from each of Oaxaca's seven regions, and representatives from Oaxaca's urban neighborhoods and municipalities. The provisional coordination was created to facilitate the operation of the APPO through different commissions, a variety of commissions were established, judicial, finance, communication, human rights, gender equity, defense of natural resources, and many more. Proposals are generated in smaller assemblies of each sector of the APPO and then brought to the General Assembly where they are debated further or ratified." End quote. Time and again, spontaneous popular assemblies such as the one created in Oaxaca have proved capable of making sound decisions and coordinating the activities of an entire population. Naturally, they also attract people who want to take over social movements, and people who consider themselves natural leaders. In many revolutions, what begins as a horizontal libertarian rebellion becomes authoritarian, as political parties or self-appointed leaders co-opt and shut down popular decision-making structures. 
highly visible participants in popular assemblies can also be pushed towards conservatism by government repression since they are the most visible targets. This is one way to interpret dynamics that developed in the APPO after the federal invasion of Oaxaca in late October 2006. As the repression intensified, some of the more vocal participants in the assembly began calling for moderation to the dismay of segments of the movement that were still in the streets. Many APPO members and movement participants complained that the group was taken over by Stalinists and other parasites who used popular movements as tools for their political ambitions. And though the APPO had always taken a stand against political parties, the self-appointed leadership took advantage of the difficult situation to call for participation in the upcoming elections as the only pragmatic course of action. Many people felt betrayed. Support for collaboration was far from universal within APPO. It was controversial even within the APPO Council, the provisional decision-making group that was emerging as a leadership body. Some people within the APPO created other formations to disseminate anarchist, indigenous, or other anti-authoritarian perspectives, and many just went on with their work and ignored the calls to flock to the voting booths. In the end, the anti-authoritarian ethic that constituted the backbone of the movement and the basis of its formal structures proved stronger. The vast majority of Oaxacans boycotted the elections. And the PRI, the conservative party that already held power, dominated among the few people who came out to cast ballots. The attempt to transform the powerful, liberatory social movements of Oaxaca into a bid for political power was an absolute failure. A smaller Oaxacan city, Zachila, population of 25,000, can provide a closer look at horizontal decision-making. For years, groups had been working together against local forms of exploitation. Among other efforts, they had managed to defeat the plan to construct a Coca-Cola plant, which would have consumed much of the available drinking water. When the rebellion erupted in Oaxaca City, a majority of the residents decided to take action. They convoked Zachila's first popular assembly with the ringing of bells, calling everyone together to share the news of the police attack in Oaxaca City and to decide what to do in their own town. More meeting and actions followed. Quote, Men, women, children, and city council members joined together to take over the municipal building. A lot of the building was locked, and we used only the hallways and the offices that were open. We stayed in the municipal building night and day, taking care of everything. And that's how the neighborhood assemblies were born. We'd say, it's the neighborhood of La Soledad's turn, and tomorrow it's up to San Jacinto. That's how the neighborhood assemblies were first used. And then later, they turned into decision-making bodies, which is where we are now. The seizing of the municipal building was totally spontaneous. The activists from before played a role and initially directed things, but the popular assembly structure was developed little by little. Neighborhood assemblies, comprised of a rotating body of five people, were also formed in each section of town, and together they would form the permanent popular assembly, the People's Council of Zachila. The people from neighborhood assemblies may not be activists at all, but little by little, as they follow their obligation to bring information back and forth from the council, they develop their capacity for leadership. All the agreements made in the council are studied by these five people, and then brought back to the neighborhoods for review. These assemblies are completely open. Anyone can attend and have their voice heard. Decisions always go to a general vote, and all the adults present can vote. For example, if some people think a bridge needs to be built, and others think we need to focus on improving electricity, we vote on what the priority would be. The simple majority wins, 50% plus one. End quote. The townsfolk kicked out the mayor while maintaining public services, and also established a community radio station. The city served as a model for dozens of other municipalities throughout the state that soon proclaimed their autonomy. Years before these events in Sachila, another group was organizing autonomous villages in the state of Oaxaca. As many as 26 rural communities affiliated with the CIPORFM, Council of Indigenous Peoples of Oaxaca, Ricardo Flores Magón, an organization that identifies with southern Mexico's tradition of indigenous and anarchist resistance. The name references an indigenous anarchist influential in the Mexican Revolution. 
insofar as they can, living under an oppressive regime, the CIPO communities assert their authority and help one another to meet their needs, ending private property and working the land communally. Typically, when a village expressed interest in joining the group, someone from the CIPO would come and explain how they worked, and let the villagers decide whether or not they wanted to join. The government frequently denied resources to CIPO villages, hoping to starve them out. But it is no surprise that many people thought they could live more richly as masters of their own lives, even if it meant greater material poverty. End of Part 1 Part 2 How Will Decisions Be Enforced? The state has so thoroughly obscured the fact that people are capable of implementing their own decisions that those raised in this society are hard-pressed to imagine how this could be done without giving a small minority the authority to coerce people into following orders. On the contrary, the power to enforce decisions should be every bit as universal and decentralized as the power to make those decisions. There have been stateless societies on every continent that used diffuse sanctions rather than specialized enforcers. Only through a long and violent process do states steal this ability from people and monopolize it as their own. This is how diffuse sanctions work. In an ongoing process, a society decides how it wants to organize and what behaviors it considers unacceptable. This may occur over time or in formal, immediate settings. The participation of everybody in making these decisions is complemented by the participation of everybody in upholding them. If somebody breaks these common standards, everyone is accustomed to reacting. They don't call the police, file a grievance, or wait for someone else to do something. They approach the person they think is in the wrong and tell him, or take another appropriate action. For example, the people in a neighborhood may decide that each different household will take turns cleaning the street. If one household fails to uphold this decision, everybody else on the block has the ability to ask them to fulfill their responsibility. Depending on how serious the transgression is, other people in the neighborhood might react with criticism, ridicule, or ostracism. If the household has a good excuse for being slack, perhaps someone living there is very sick and the others are busy taking care of her, the neighbors can choose to have sympathy and forgive the lapse. This flexibility and sensitivity are typically lacking in a law-based system. On the other hand, if the negligent household has no excuse, and not only do they never clean the streets, they, they throw their trash in it, their neighbors might hold a general meeting, demanding a change in their behavior, or they might take some action like piling all the trash in front of their door. Meanwhile, in their day-to-day -day interactions, individual neighbors might share their criticisms with members of the offending household, or ridicule them, not invite them to joint activities, or glare at them in the streets. If someone is incorrigibly antisocial, always blocking or contradicting the desires of the rest of the group, and refusing to respond to people's concerns, the ultimate response is to kick that person out of the group. This method is much more flexible and more liberating than legalitarian, coercive approaches. Rather than being bound to the blind letter of the law, which cannot take into account specific circumstances or people's needs, and depending on a powerful minority for enforcement, the method of diffuse sanctions allows everyone to weigh for herself how serious the transgression is. It also allows transgressors the opportunity to convince others that their actions were justified, thus providing constant challenges to the dominant morality. By contrast, in a statist system, the authorities don't have to show that something is right or wrong before condemning someone's home or confiscating a drug deemed illegal. All they have to do is cite a statute in a law book that their victims had no hand in writing. In a horizontal society, people enforce decisions according to how enthusiastic they are about those decisions. If almost everybody strongly supports a decision, it will be upheld vigorously, whereas if a decision leaves most people feeling neutral or unenthusiastic, it will only be partially enforced, leaving open more room for creative transgression and exploring other solutions. On the other hand, 
A lack of enthusiasm in implementing decisions might mean that in practice, organization falls on the shoulders of informal power holders, people who are delegated an unofficial position of leadership by the rest of the group, whether they want it or not. This means that members of horizontal groups, from collective houses to entire societies, must confront the problem of self-discipline. They must hold themselves accountable to the standards they have agreed upon and the criticism of their peers, and risk being unpopular or confronting conflict by criticizing those who do not uphold common standards, calling out the housemate who does not do the dishes, or the community that does not contribute to road maintenance. It's a difficult process, often lacking in many current anarchist projects, but without it, group decision-making is a facade and responsibility is vague and unequally shared. Going through this process, people become more empowered and more connected with those around them. Groups always contain the possibility for conformity and conflict. Authoritarian groups typically avoid conflict by enforcing greater levels of conformity. Pressures to conform also exist in anarchist groups, but without restrictions on human movement, it is easier for people to leave and join other groups, or to act and live on their own. Thus, people can choose the levels of conformity and conflict they want to tolerate, and in the process of finding and leaving groups, people change and challenge social norms. In the newly created state of Israel, Jews, who had participated in socialist movements in Europe, took the opportunity to create hundreds of kibbutzim, utopian communal farms. In these farms, the members created a strong example of communal living and decision-making. At a typical kibbutz, most decisions were made at a general town meeting, held twice weekly. The frequency and length of meetings stemmed from the fact that so many aspects of social life were open to debate, and the common belief that proper decisions, quote, can only be made after intensive group discussion. There were about a dozen elected positions in the kibbutz related to managing the commune's financial affairs and coordinating production and trade, but the general policy had to be decided in general meetings. Official positions were limited to terms of a few years, and the members encouraged a culture of office-hating, a reluctance to take office, and a disdain for those who appeared to be power-hungry. No one in the kibbutz had coercive authority. Neither were there police in the kibbutz, though it was common for everyone to leave their doors unlocked. Public opinion was the most important factor ensuring social cohesion. If there was a problem with the member of the commune, it was discussed at the general meeting. But most of the time, even the threat of it being brought up at the general meeting motivated people to work out their differences. In the worst case scenario, if a member refused to accept group decisions, the rest of the collective would vote to kick her out. But this ultimate sanction differs from the coercive tactics used by the state in a key respect. Voluntary groups only exist because everyone involved wants to work with everyone else. A person who is excluded is not deprived of the ability to survive or maintain relationships, as there are many other groups she can join. More importantly, she is not forced to abide by collective decisions. In a society based on this principle, people would enjoy a social mobility that is denied to people in statist contexts, in which the laws are enforced upon an individual whether she approves of them or not. In any case, expulsion was not common in the kibbutzim, because public opinion and group discussion were sufficient to solve most conflicts. But the kibbutzim had other problems, which can teach us important lessons about creating collectives. After about a decade, the kibbutzim began to succumb to the pressures of the capitalist world that surrounded them. Although internally the kibbutzim were strikingly communal, they were never properly anti-capitalist. From the beginning, they attempted to exist as competitive producers within a capitalist economy. The need to compete in the economy, and thus to industrialize, encouraged a greater reliance on experts, while influence from the rest of society fostered consumerism. At the same time, there was a negative reaction to the lack of privacy intentionally structured into the kibbutz. Common showers, for example. 
The purpose of this lack of privacy was to engineer a more communal spirit. But because the designers of the kibbutz did not realize that privacy is as important to people's well-being as social connectedness, kibbutz members began to feel stifled over time and withdrew from the public life of the kibbutz, including their participation in decision-making. Another vital lesson of the kibbutzim is that building utopian collectives must involve tireless struggle against contemporary authoritarian structures, or they will become part of those structures. The kibbutzim were founded on land seized by the Israeli state from Palestinians, against whom genocidal policies are still continuing today. The racism of the European founders allowed them to ignore the abuse inflicted on the previous inhabitants of what they saw as a promised land, much the same way religious pilgrims in North America plundered the indigenous to construct their new society. The Israeli state gained incredibly from the fact that nearly all their potential dissidents, including socialists and veterans of armed struggles against Nazism and colonialism, voluntarily sequestered themselves in escapist communities that contributed to the capitalist economy. If these utopians had used the kibbutz as a base to struggle against capitalism, and colonialism in solidarity with the Palestinians while constructing the foundations of a communal society, history in the Middle East might have turned out differently. Part 3. Who will settle disputes? Anarchist methods of settling disputes open up a much healthier range of options than are available within a capitalist and statist system. Stateless societies throughout history have come up with numerous methods for settling disputes that seek compromise, allow for reconciliation, and keep power in the hands of their disputants and their community. The Nubians are a society of sedentary farmers in Egypt. They were traditionally stateless, and even according to recent accounts, they consider it highly immoral to bring in the government to solve disputes. In contrast to the individualistic and legalistic ways of viewing disputes in authoritarian societies, the norm in Nubian culture is to consider one person's problem everyone's problem. When there is a dispute, strangers, friends, relatives, or other third parties intercede to help the disputants find a mutually satisfying resolution. According to anthropologist Robert Fernia, Nubian culture regards quarrels between members of a kinship group as dangerous in that they threaten the supportive social net upon which all depend. This culture of cooperation and mutual responsibility is backed up by economic and social structures as well. Among the Nubians, properties such as water wheels, cattle, and palm trees have traditionally been communally owned so that in the daily work of feeding themselves, people are immersed in cooperative social bonds that teach solidarity and the importance of getting along. Additionally, the kinship groups which comprise Nubian society, called Nogs, are interwoven, not atomized like the isolated nuclear families of Western society. Quote, this means that a person's Nogs are overlapping and involve diverse, dispersed membership. This feature is very important, for the Nubian community does not easily split into opposing factions. Most disputes are resolved quickly by a third relative. Larger disputes that embroil more people are solved in a family council with all the members of the Nog, including women and children. The council is presided over by an elder kinsman, but the goal is to reach consensus and get the disputants to reconcile. The Hopi of southwestern North America used to be more warlike than in recent times. Factions still exist within Hopi villages, but they overcome conflict through cooperation and rituals, and they use shame and leveling mechanisms with people who are boastful or domineering. When disputes get out of hand, they use ritual clown skits at kachina dances to mock the people involved. The Hopi offer an example of a society that gave up feuding and developed rituals to cultivate a more peaceful disposition. The image of clowns and dances being used to solve disputes gives a tantalizing glimpse of humor and art as means for responding to common problems. 
There is a world of possibilities more interesting than general assemblies or mediation processes. Artistic conflict resolution encourages new ways of looking at problems and subverts the possibility of permanent mediators or meeting facilitators gaining power by monopolizing the role of arbiter. Part 4. Meeting in the Streets Politicians and technocrats are clearly not capable of making responsible decisions for millions of people. They have learned enough from their many past mistakes that governments usually do not collapse under the weight of their own incompetence, but they have hardly created the best of all possible worlds. If they can manage to keep their absurd bureaucracies functioning, it's not a wild jump of logic to think that we could organize our communities at least as well ourselves. The hypothesis of authoritarian society, that a large, diverse population needs specialized institutions to, to control decision-making, can be disproven many times over. The MST of Brazil shows that in a huge group of people, most decision-making power can reside at the grassroots level, with individual communities that take care of their own needs. The people of Oaxaca showed that an entire modern society can organize itself and coordinate resistance against constant assault by police and paramilitaries with open assemblies. Anarchist Infoshops and Israeli Kibbutzim show that groups running complex operations that have to pay rent or meet production schedules while accomplishing social and cultural objectives capitalist em enterprises never even attempt can make decisions in a timely fashion and uphold these decisions without a class of enforcers. The Nuer show that horizontal decision-making can thrive for generations, even after colonization, and that with a shared culture of restorative conflict resolution, there is no need for a specialized institution to solve disputes. For most of human history, our societies have been egalitarian and self-organizing, and we have not lost the capability to make and uphold the decisions that affect our lives, or to imagine new and better forms of organizing. Whenever people overcome alienation and come together with their neighbors, they develop exciting new ways of coordinating and making decisions. Once they liberated themselves from landlords, priests, and mayors, the uneducated and downtrodden peasants of Aragon proved themselves equal to the task of making not just a whole new world, but hundreds of them. New decision-making methods are usually influenced by pre-existing institutions and cultural values. When people recapture decision-making authority over some aspect of their lives, they should ask themselves what reference points and precedents already exist in their culture, and what ingrained disadvantages they will have to overcome. For example, there may be a tradition of town meetings that can be expanded from symbolic window dressing to real self-organization. On the other hand, people might be starting from a macho culture, in which case they will have to learn how to listen, compromise, and ask questions. Alternately, if a group develops a decision-making method that is totally original and alien to their society, they may face challenges, including newcomers, and explaining their method to outsiders. This is sometimes a weakness of info shops in the United States, which employ a well-thought-out, idealized form of a decision-making complex enough to seem foreign even to many participants. An anti-authoritarian group may use some form of consensus, or of majoritarian voting. Large groups may find voting quicker and more efficient, but it can also silence a minority. Perhaps the most important part of the process is the discussion that happens before the decision. Voting does not diminish the importance of methods that allow everyone to communicate and arrive at good compromises. Many autonomous villages in Oaxaca ultimately used voting to make decisions, and they provided an inspiring example of self-organization to radicals who otherwise abhor voting. Though a group's structure doubtlessly influences its culture and outcomes, the formality of voting may be an acceptable expedient if all the discussion that takes place before it is steeped in a spirit of solidarity and cooperation. In a self-organizing society, not everyone will participate equally in meetings or other formal spaces. A decision-making body can eventually become dominated by certain people, and the assembly itself can become a bureaucratic institution with coercive powers. 
For this reason, it may be necessary to develop decentralized and overlapping forms of organization and decision making, and to preserve space for spontaneous organization to occur outside of all pre-existing structures. If there is only one structure in which all decisions are made, an internal culture can develop that is not inclusive to everyone in the society, then experienced insiders can rise to positions of leadership and human activity external to the structure can be delegitimized. Soon enough, you have a government. The kibbutzim and APPO both evidence the creeping development of bureaucracy and specialization. But if there are multiple decision-making structures for different spheres of life, and if they can arise or fade out according to need, none of them can monopolize authority. In this regard, power needs to stay in the streets, in the homes, in the hands of the people who exercise it, in the meeting of people who come together to solve problems. Recommended Reading Gaston Laval, Collectives in the Spanish Revolution, London Freedom Press, 1975, translated by Vernon Richards. Melford E. Spiro, Kibbutz, Venture in Utopia, New York, Schocken Books, 1963. Peter Gelderloos, Consensus, A New Handbook for Grassroots Social, Political, and Environmental Groups, Tucson, C-Sharp Press, 2006. Natasha Gordon and Paul Chatterton, Taking Back Control, A Journey Through Argentina's Popular Uprising, Leeds, UK, University of Leeds, 2004. Marianne Mackelberg, The Will of the Many, How the Ultra-Globalization Movement is Changing the Face of Democracy, London, Pluto Press, 2009. End of chapter two. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.